to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in those days there was no king in israel every man did what was right in his own eyes Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. Welcome to our study of the book of Judges. As Judges 17, 6 and Judges 21, 25 teach, Israel was living in a time of anarchy, a time of confusion. <clears throat> Every man had become, as it were, a god to himself, had left the real god of Israel, and was living how he wanted to live, doing what he wanted to do, and fulfilling every lust that man wanted to feel. And thus, the key idea is the anarchy of Israel and their departure from God. But as you think about the ideas found in the book of Judges, we find that apostasy always leads to destruction. God's people have chosen their own path. As a result, over and over again in the book of Judges, Israel will go into great apostasy. As a result of that apostasy, they will face destruction either at the hand of God or the hand of their enemies, and eventually that will promote them to cry out to God, and God will save them. And so as you study Judges, there's this cycle over and over again, apostasy, destruction, defeat by their enemies, repentance and turning to God, and then God blessing them, and they keep falling in this same rut. You know, a powerful lesson that we need to learn from the judges is that instead of getting caught up in apostasy and over and over again having to be reminded how good God is, how much God has blessed us, we need to maintain faithfulness. We need to live every day for Jesus Christ. And so what are some of the lessons, some of those living lessons in the book of Judges that will help us to be more faithful to God? In the book of Judges, very early, we learn that men and women, God's people, must not get entangled with this old world. Notice what Judges says in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Of the Israelites, the scripture says, Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you. But notice now, they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Here God has strictly warned His people for their own benefit, don't get caught up with these heathen people. The people who worship false gods, the people involved in religious error, the people of this land who are very immoral, don't let them have an effect on you. And God said, as long as you do that, I'm going to continue to bless you. But what did Israel do? Over and over and over again, they got intermingled with the people of the world. They even married some. They're up on the mountain worshiping with, worshiping with them. And God said, because of that, I'm not going to bless you. Friend, there's a very powerful lesson that we need to learn from the book of Judges about the world, and that is we too must not get caught up with this old world. John said in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, Do not love the world or all that is in the world. Lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the evil one. And then he said this, And the world and all that's in it is passing away. But he who does the will of God, he'll endure forever. Just like in the days of Israel, Christians need to be reminded, don't get entangled, don't get intermingled, don't get caught up in this world, for all that's in the world isn't from God. You know, in the book of James, some had got caught up in the world. And God used some of the strongest language in Scripture to remind them this isn't right. James said in James 4, verse 4, 
adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world, notice, has made himself an enemy of God. You can't have the best of both. You can't live for the world and for God. You've got to be committed to God. Paul said it this way, and I want you to notice what 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18 says about Christians coming out of the world. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Just like in the days of Israel, God has said to us, come out from them. Be separate. Don't get entangled with them, and then we can have that relationship. Well, why is it that God doesn't want me to be a part of the world? Friend, because the world, with all its lust, all its desires, will pull us away from God. Do you remember a man in Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21? That man had a great crop year. So much so that the Bible says he tore down his barns and built bigger barns. And then he said to his soul, So you've got many goods, laid it for many years. In essence, eat, drink, and be merry. Have your share of the world and live it up. What did God say to that man? You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. The world tempted that man. It pulled him away from God. It caused him to lose sight of what was really important. And friend, God warns us of the world because it will do the same thing if we let it. From the book of Judges, we also learn a very powerful lesson about how the obedience to God brings blessings in this life. Look at what is said in Judges chapter 2 and verse 7. The scripture says, So the people served the Lord, all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Here the people have been faithful, they've been following God and God has richly blessed them because of their obedience to God and His leaders. Well, we're going to see that that's going to change not too shortly in a, in a little bit of time in the book of Judges but there's a very powerful lesson about my need and your need, our need to obey God, and then His blessings will be ours. Friend, it's not just people who mouth the words, Jesus, or who claim to be a Christian that are faithful. It's those that are obedient to Him. Do you remember Matthew 7, verse 21? Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Does Jesus expect me? Does He expect His children to be obedient? Absolutely. John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. I can't say I love God and not do what He says. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said to the religious elite, to the pious Jewish leaders, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And thus, He is only the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. But notice, just like in the days of Judges, there's a great blessing in obeying God. Look what is said at the close of the New Testament in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. The Scripture records for us, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. Those who do God's commandments, those who obey His will, they're the ones who are going to be blessed. They're the ones who are going to find the tree of life. They're the ones going into that heavenly city. And so, friend, just like in the times of the judges, when they followed God, they were blessed. They went into that land of milk and honey. They conquered their enemies. So it'll be for us. If we live faithful to God and obey His will, we can have that heavenly home. You know, there's an interesting statement made about the Israelites in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. And I think it says a great deal about their following God and what's going to ultimately be their failure. Notice Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. The scripture says, When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, 
another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. What was wrong with these people? Why didn't they know God? They didn't think about all his blessings. They didn't think about where they were at and all that God had given them. How we today need to have that same mindset of being reminded of what God is so we can know the Lord. Well, what does it really mean to know the Lord? John 17, 3, Jesus said, This is eternal life that you may know the true and living God and His Son whom He sent, Jesus Christ. Knowing God means that I have that e hope of eternal life, that I am a child of God, and that every day I'm reminded of the blessings and the benefits of God. You know, we think, how could Israel have so easily have forgotten God? Think about the ten plagues. Think about all their enemies God had conquered, all the battles they had won. And yet, are we really that different than Israel? Think about how much God has blessed your life, how much He has richly blessed you and blessed me, how He has taken care of us, and sometimes we're so quick to forget God's blessings and a failure to follow Him every day will always result. And so I need to make sure that I do remember God, that I do know the Lord, that I'm a child of His, and that I'm walking in the light each and every day as I strive to follow Him. Now, another great passage teaches us about a lesson about Israel and a lesson that we need to be reminded of, and it's found in Judges chapter 2 and verse 16. Notice what the Scripture here says. The Bible says... Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. You know, from this passage, I learn of Israel, God was so much better to them than they deserved. They had not followed God. A new generation rose up who didn't know God. They're going to be doing things that are ungodly. And every time, every time they'll turn back to God, God will forgive them, and God will richly bless them. You know, we think of Israel, but do we really think about ourselves? Look in my life and look into your own. And hasn't God been better to us than we deserve? Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no shadow or variation of turning. Of His own will, He got, begot us as His own children. Think about how God has blessed me. All the rich blessings I received from His hand. Philippians 4.19, the Bible says we have everything we need in Christ Jesus. Matthew 6.33, God has given to us all things for life and godliness. If we seek first the kingdom, all these things will be provided. Hebrews 8 and verse 12, God said, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. The food, the shelter, the clothing, the spiritual family I have, the forgiveness of sins. Did I deserve that? No, but look how God has been so good to me and so good to you. He's been better to us than we deserve. You know, in view of that, Romans 2 verse 4 teaches us a very powerful lesson. Notice this principle. The Bible says in Romans 2 verse 4, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? Notice now, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. When I think about how good God is and how He's been so so good to me, so much more than I deserve, it ought to lead me to have a penitent attitude. I want to make God happy. When I find sin in my life, I want to get rid of that. I want to avoid the way of evil, and I want to follow God each and every day of my life. And friend, I'll promise you this. If you'll be faithful to God, and if God is with you, then no man shall be able to stand against you. This is what we learn from Judges chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Notice that text. The scripture says, So God said to Gideon, or so Gideon said to God, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, so I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely 
I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. God says to Gideon, you're going to win. And Midian says, God, don't you remember? My family is the smallest family, and not only that, in essence, I'm the run of the family. And you want me to win the battle? And God says, if I'm with you, the Midianites don't have a chance. Friend, Paul repeats similar sentiments to these. In Romans 8, verses 31 through 39, where he said, If God is for us, who can be against us? Neither death, nor famine, nor peril, nor sword, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If I have God in my life and I'm living faithful to Him, then how true the words are. Philippians 4, verse 13. Through Christ... I can do all things. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 teaches us that with God we can accomplish all and no man can defeat us. Let your life be without covetousness, Paul said, or the Hebrew writer said. Be content with such things as you have. Why? For he, God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, what shall man do to me? You know, when you think about that statement God made to Gideon, and then you think about all that God did for him, reduce Gideon's army to a mere 300 men, and they defeated thousands in battle. How was that? Because God plus that 300 would always be the majority. And God in my life and God in yours will always help us to accomplish the things that we need. And thus, we've got to learn a very powerful lesson don't trust men, trust in God. I want you to notice what is said in Judges chapter 8 in verse 23 and then in verse 33. The scripture says in Judges 8 verse 23, But Gideon said to them, the people have said to Gideon, You rule over us. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now in verse 33, so it was. As soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals, will the Baal beareth their God. Here you've got the people coming to uh, judges to Gideon and saying, we want you to be our king in essence. And Gideon said, no, God's over you. I don't want to be over you. My sons are not going to be over you. And the moment he dies, they stop trusting Gideon. They go right back into that apostasy. I've got to learn in my life, we've got to learn in our life, not to put our trust in men, but to put our trust in God. Don't put your trust in preachers or elders, family members, friends, or religious leaders. I can promise you this, at one time or another, some of those people are going to let you down in your life. But if you will put your trust in God, God will never let you down. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3 verse 6, God said, I am God, I change not. Put your trust in God, not in men, and you'll never ever be led astray. As we study the book of Judges, there's a lesson that I think all of us need to learn. And Jephthah had to learn it the hard way. Jephthah is now judge over Israel in Judges chapter 11. He's about to go into battle. And before he goes into battle, he's going to make a promise to God, a promise that he will ultimately regret. Notice what he says in Judges chapter 11, verse 31, and what happens in verse 34. The scripture says in Judges chapter 11, verse 31, Jephthah says, Then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's. I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now verse 34. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughters. You know, you think about Jephthah and you think, well, he was a a great man of God. He was a judge. He was going out to defeat the uh, ungodly nations around them and he just makes the promise, God, I, I want to show you back some kind of favor, some kind of blessing. I want to do something for you in essence. He says, you give me the victory and whatever comes out of my house to meet me, I'm going to give it to you. Little did Jephthah know that his daughter, 
His only daughter, his only child came out to meet him. Now the text says Jephthah fulfilled his vow. He gave her to God and whether we believe that he gave her to God as a sacrifice, a burnt offering as he said, or whether he devoted her life to service in the temple perpetually, whatever the view may be of that, what a great loss that must have been to Jephthah. That's the point. And the main lesson is don't make rash vows. Don't promise something unless you think it through, unless you're very serious about it. Here's what Jesus said. In Matthew 5, verse 37, Jesus taught the Jews who were really good about swearing. They would swear by the temple. They'd swear by the hairs on their head. They'd swear by the gold on the temple. And Jesus said, don't do that. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. James 5, verse 12, we're told don't swear at all. Instead of saying, God, if you do this, I'm going to give you that, or I'm going to, no, you just be faithful to God regardless. When I make a promise to God that I'm going to be faithful, I just simply need to fulfill that vow. Now, we don't need to make rash vows, but when we do make a vow, we need to fulfill it to God. And friend, haven't all those who've obeyed the gospel made a promise to God? I promised that when I arose out of the waters of baptism, I was going to walk in newness of life. How I need to fulfill that. How I need to be faithful to God unto death. Now, there's a couple of other lessons that we learn from the book of Judges that I think help us in our Christian walk. Unlike Samson, who we are introduced to in Judges chapter 13 and 14, instead of being self-willed like Samson, how we need to be God-willed, how we need to do the will of God. You know, Samson is given a, a pretty good name in Hebrews chapter 11 for the final act of self-sacrifice that he made. But most of Samson's life was lived in selfishness and ungodliness. For example, notice Judges chapter 14 beginning in verse 1. The scripture says of the hero of the Bible, Samson, in Judges 14, verse 1, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now notice his behavior. So he went up and told his father and his mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people? that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. You know, Samson may have good motives. He, he thinks, I'm going to use this against them, but regardless, it was against the will of God. God had already said, in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, don't intermingle, don't intermarry, don't have anything to do with these heathens. What, what was Samson's mentality? You go get her, she makes me happy. And when his parents said, now wait a minute, Samson, let's get somebody from your own people. Remember what God said? He said, no, 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 I want her, go get her. What was Samson being driven by? Well, he's being driven by lust. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. She was beautiful to behold. He wanted to have relations with her. And so he said, she's good looking. I want to have her. You go get her. His parents couldn't persuade him. You know, too many times in this life, we let our lust of the eyes and our lust of the flesh be what motivates us. Peter gave us some great advice in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He said this, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, listen, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Imagine if only Samson had resisted that lust. If he had only resisted that appeal that he had, that desire for the beautiful. Imagine what would have happened. He could have done great things in the kingdom of God and been a great judge. Instead, Samson's life is a disaster he goes from one disaster to the next until ultimately hit both of his eyes are poked out. He's in a, a jail, in essence, we'd say, in prison, and as a final act. And it's a great act of self-sacrifice. He kills all the people in the banqueting hall, and it says in Judges chapter 15 and 16 that at his death, 
He killed more than all he did in his life. Samson's life was a failure in many ways because he allowed his lust of the flesh to drive him. Now, there's one more lesson that we need to learn in the book of Judges, and it's this. The people in the book of Judges were so ungodly and so immoral that some of them were only driven and motivated by wickedness, immorality, and the desires of the flesh. For example, in Judges chapter 19, verses 22 through 28, there is a man who comes into the area of Benjamin. He brings his concubine with him, and someone invites that man to stay in their house. The people have been watching in the area, and they say, in essence, this is someone new. And so they go to the house, they begin to beat the door down on the house, and they say, we've seen this new person in essence, bring him out. We want to have relations with him. They wanted to have homosexual relations with this man. Instead, the man gives him his concubine. They spend all night with her until she comes back to the door and is in essence dead. But look at their desires. A new man comes to town and how do you treat him? Bring him out, let's have relations with him. Look at the gross immorality that had haunted the nation of Israel. Friend, America is not far from that. Romans 1 verses 26 through 29 says that homosexuality is vile, it's unnatural, and it is an action that is deserving of punishment. Leviticus 18, 22, it was an abomination to God, something God so strongly hated that He said, if you find them doing it, put them to death. What was Israel's main problem? In those days, there was no king in Israel. No, not even God. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. How we need to realize that we're living under the control of God today and that we need to put Him first in our life. Friend, have you done that? Are you a child of God? Have you heard the Word? Do you believe in Jesus as God's Son? Would you repent of the evil in your life? and turn to God? Would you be willing to make that great confession and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? Acts 2 verse 38. And if you are a child of God, are you letting God rule your life? Are you faithfully following the Lord each and every day? May it never be said of us that there was no God in our life, but rather that we faithfully follow God each and every day. May God bless us as we strive to do His will. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're Christ, concerned about lost this souls, is the gospel not your love. Of Christ and to God we encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 458 3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee 37111.